Ilya Palasuchin is a co-founder of Near Protocol and grew up in Kharkiv, Ukraine. A day after the Russian invasion, he joined the Unchained Crypto Fund as a multi-sig signer. As a multi-sig signer, he and 10 others decide how the fund is spent. In less than a month, the fund has already raised $7 million worth of crypto for humanitarian aid in Ukraine. In this video, we discuss the legalization of crypto in Ukraine, how the Unchained Fund is impacting lives, and how the Russian-Ukraine conflict is defining the role of crypto. I'm Jackson Dumont, and this is a Cointelegraph interview. It's great to have you on the show today, and I can't even imagine what you're going through right now. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting. And yeah, it's been, a, it's been tough. Um, I mean, it's almost three weeks, so. The president of Ukraine recently signed a law which will create a new legal framework for crypto in Ukraine. Can you tell us a bit more about what's going on there? For sure, yeah. So that, that kind of project been in the works for the past two years. And so that was kind of a huge work by the Ministry of Digital Transformation, which also doing a lot of uh, uh, great things right now. And so right now it was just ratified by the president. So it kind of uh, is active. And so kind of overall, this really means that, you know, crypto is like as any other, any other assets, uh, like, I mean, the specific rules, how, how it operates and like pretty much digital currencies. And it's, uh, I mean, there's a set, set of specific rules that apply, like what does that mean? How um, can be held and operated by various entities? And then the kind of the one condition there is like, uh, is adding this taxation rules on the, on the uh, kind of the Ukrainian IRS uh, side. And so then, uh, and they will have actually a interesting kind of forgiveness program where you can declare all your crypto assets, uh, tax them at a very moderate amount, and then this will be fully kind of now above board and going forward uh, into the system. And so in general, like if, if this kind of horrendous events did not happen, uh, like Ukraine was like on a really good track to become kind of huge crypto hub, uh, I mean, in the world, but especially in, in Europe, uh, part of the reason why I was like actually spending a lot of more time setting up uh, a lot of kind of near ecosystem there as well. Gotcha, gotcha. So, you know, was there a particular reason why they pushed through this legislation right now? Because there's been a lot of talk about how crypto is going to be used to support Ukraine in the conflict, how to circumvent even Russian sanctions possibly. Like the role of crypto in all this is still very unclear. Is the legislation an avenue for Ukraine to receive more aid in the form of crypto? So independent of this legislation, what has happened is that crypto became largest driver for humanitarian help, as well as some of the military help uh, for Ukraine. So kind of day one, right, we all like, holy shit, you know, this is happening. What can we do? Right. This was like, really, I'm sitting in New York. It's like evening. Just got a call from my mom saying, you know, they're like, she's hearing explosions seen on the news, you know, the, the kind of Putin declaring pretty much war to Ukraine and like, what can I do? And, you know, you go first, like, look for what are the ways to support the country. What we started doing as well as Ministry of Digital Transformation is setting up crypto addresses, which can receive donations. And then even beyond that is then start deploying this capital, right? So uh, we set up the Unchained Fund. So this is a Kind of eight crypto entrepreneurs from Ukraine, as well as a few, like some folks uh, from outside, like uh, uh, founder of Gitcoin, as well joined, uh, who are uh, kind of on the multi sig of uh, addresses across all the networks. So, obviously, near, but also Ethereum, you know, uh, Bitcoin, Harmony, Avalanche, um, and uh, and with all those networks, so you see, and with all those networks, right, you can set up, set it up, and you can start receiving funds, and you can start deploying funds as well. So we so far uh, collected seven million dollars already, two and a half million dollars are deployed. Right? There's reports, there's you know clear transaction history where money are going. Uh, you can kind of create like a, a a full system, like an NGO system in days, right, instead of months. That would take to create a new nonprofit, set up banks accounts, you know, get all the legal structure, make sure that people can wire money to it without problems, right? Like this crypto, we were able to do it really quickly, have volunteers, have, have you know, CRM built around that and start deploying capital. And from government to humanitarian need to kind of the existing NGOs, like all of them are using it 
crypto community itself became really powerful for us, right? We have kind of chats with crypto people everywhere in all the cities. We're helping people getting resources, you know, getting food, getting protective equipment for the territorial defense. Um, you know, obviously it's it's really tough time, but at the same time, it, it kind of brought, brought people together in, in, in many ways and, and crypto have been part of this bloodline that it was able to kind of continue uh, sounds the systems working. Yeah, I mean, this was the situation that crypto was meant for, right? Being able to bypass borders and giving equitable financial access to people in need. So we touched on a lot of stuff just there. So I kind of want to go back and pick apart some of that a little bit. Let's say that I'm Ukrainian. I receive crypto from the Unchained Fund or someone from outside of the country. How do I turn that crypto into food, water, gasoline, as you said? How do I, how do I cash out, essentially? Yeah, for sure. I think there have been few routes. One is actually a lot more people are starting to accept crypto. I think actually from, from, from the government numbers, they say 40% of their suppliers are willing to take on crypto directly. Um, and similarly on the ground, a lot of people are taking, willing to take crypto, especially if we're talking stable coins, because uh, obviously Grivna right now is in a little bit unclear situation, uh, although it's been kind of also really great to see it being reasonably stable, but people are uh, you know, reasonably want to want to be able to kind of be hedged against the exchange, uh, like exchange uh, rate risk. And so they're willing to kind of keep USDT. Actually, USDT is trading at a huge premium right now in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so there is a lot of kind of just natural demand for people to take on crypto. And then even if they don't, and for, for many reasons, right, there still needs to be kind of a Grivna payouts to the system. Uh, the exchanges uh, that operate in Ukraine are offering green pairs and you're able to withdraw directly to your kind of cards, uh, like debit cards. Similarly to Binance, have been, uh, you can able to do that as well. And so it's actually like relatively straightforward and very quick to move, um, to move uh, an exchange to Grivna and then get it on your card. And so then you can pay this card and there's still some I would say a lot less, obviously, but uh, like cash, cash and exchanges as well uh, that you can uh, operate. Would you say that crypto is sort of becoming a de facto legal tender in Ukraine? I mean, I would say Grivna is still the <laughs> the legal currency, but I, I would say the crypto adoption have definitely jumped, uh, uh, and and kind of people are definitely willing and 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 wanting to uh, operate more in it. And I think we'll see, especially after this law, like people will actually con going to continue to like ramp up the adoption. Yeah, because that's kind of the direction it feels like we're heading in. For those watching who aren't sure exactly what we're referring to, think about El Salvador adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. This means that merchants in El Salvador, like clothing shops or grocery stores, must accept Bitcoin as a payment. So, I mean, to me, when I see this framework and the way you describe the current climate there in Ukraine in regards to crypto, it does seem like we're heading towards that direction of full-scale adoption. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. Uh, and I think it's it's definitely the direction that government wanted to go even before this war started. So I think kind of it, it postponed some other things and hopefully, you know, the war is going to end very soon and we can start rebuilding everything. But I think crypto will become a huge engine for, uh, for future development of Ukraine. And let's talk about Unchained Fund. So $7 million have already been raised to support Ukrainians. You are one of the signers of the multi-sig wallet. Tell me, if I scan the QR code on the website and donate some money to the fund, what avenue does that take? How does it get into the hands of Ukrainians? Yeah, so there are a few routes that kind of this has been taking. One is we have kind of screened and, and whitelisted few existing NGOs which are deploying capital. Like this is, you know, helping like specific NGO that helps kids. Uh, with evacuation and getting them into safe place like like right now in europe there are a few places where these kids have been moved so that ngo needs funding so been allocating some funds to that but then a lot more is because between our network and kind of broader crypto network there's actually a lot of volunteers on the ground there's like some friends some of the near ecosystem people are on the ground either in territorial defense or helping with kind of supplies helping with uh, you know driving people like some of you know people I work with has actually been you know driving around getting people food and water, and so they need funds to kind of acquire this and 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 get the get things around. So there's a system built which allows people to apply, 
go through a KYC process, uh, proof of location as well, because we actually have been getting uh, a bunch of scan as well, and then uh, and then get funded uh, to to get the gear, to get the food, to get the water, to maybe fund you know buying some evacuation equipment or or, or paying for the evacuation of people from uh, really uh, terrible, terrible situations. And then kind of beyond that, uh, starting to explore what are the other ways we can start kind of building up supplies uh, that then can be distributed across Ukraine and things like that. So really kind of, it started with like, I would say immediate response type of thing. And now it's starting to become more kind of how do we build out a set of supplies that then can be distributed across Ukraine and build up a little bit of a logistics there as well. And you started this fund in February, right? Well, yeah, it's, it was started pretty much on like day after the war started. That's that's incredible that you were able to move so fast to provide aid in that situation. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the point is that the reality, like you can start this fund in, you know, in a matter of minutes. And then, you know, you publish the website, you start, you start getting uh, donations and then you can start distributing them as well, right? So... Uh, and, and so I think like, I, I have not, I don't, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm pretty sure this is from like NGO perspective, you know, distributing $2.5 million to like actual direct, you know, like we have hundreds and hundreds of applications. I think, um, over 1600 applications have been processed so far, right? We, we, are, we actually process, like we process and pay out hundred applications per day right now. Uh, or more, right? And this is like small amounts, small checks, buying food, buying, you know, some equipment, uh, getting this to direct to people. Like, you know, we have photos of people who are like getting, you know, food baskets, for example, in Kharkiv and, uh, you know, people who've been commenting that like they were able to get medicine, like insulin, for example, which is, uh, if people are diabetic, it's it's huge need. So really like, you know, real people, real stories kind of across, across the whole Ukraine. Thanks for your take on that. Now, the last thing I want to discuss here was about a month ago, the Ukrainian government said that they were going to do an airdrop, and then they announced it was going to be an NFT airdrop, and then nothing happened. Could you explain a little bit more what was going on in that situation? Yeah, so I think they, they I mean, to be clear, like they're under a ton of stress. They, what they're doing like is super important. They, you know, reuniting IT army, they you know, protecting the Ukrainian infrastructure. The fact that Ukrainian infrastructure continues working is, I think, like huge benefit. You know, most of the services are continue working. You can open companies, you can pay taxes, you can all do all those things, which, you know, you would be like uh, surprised, like the country that, you know, have like in, in the active war is actually has all the stuff working. And so that's really like their main focus. <clears throat> and obviously kind of being present communicating exactly what's happening with the country, which has been a super important driver. Um, and so my understanding is they always, they wanted to do an NFT, like the airdrop part meant airdrop of NFTs. And uh, that they just did like, did not explain that correctly. I mean, to, like Twitter is hard. Yeah. And then, and then I think like at this point, it's just like not the right time. Like the goal, the, the goal for something like this would be to, really kind of highlight the people who have contributed to this programs, to this crypto donations, right? And and kind of uh, pretty much, I mean, not reward in financial way, but actually, you know, hi highlight that uh, their contribution. And it's just like not, I mean, at least from my perspective, it's not the right time. I think like when the war ends, you know, we can start kind of uh, doing things like that and be, and being kind of, you know, giving credit to people who have supported it but right now we need to you know we need to get this war to stop right we need to win it we need to get people equipped and and uh, fully uh, fully kind of you know safe get people out of out of the places etc and so that i think like everybody's focused on that it's on kind of winning the war and, and keeping people safe so i'd like to give you the floor now for any final words you have to say to our audience for sure yeah i think kind of in general i mean it's been it's been a very hard weeks for all the Ukrainians. So uh, if you know if you know anyone uh, who is from Ukraine or, or uh, whose family is from Ukraine, please kind of extend your um, your friendship, your love to them. Like a lot of people have actually a really hard time right now. Uh, they need your support. That that's my kind of um, word of kindness that you you should extend. Um, you know, support these initiatives. There's a lot of kind of uh, this 
kind of avenues to support, you know, Ukraine, this is a chain fund, you know, come back alive uh, directly to Ministry of Digital Transformation, uh, the digital.gov.ua. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, kind of, um, you can participate in, in uh, if you're in, especially in European Union, we have launched Away from Ukraine, which is a portal to collect all the volunteer information and all the information for Ukrainians who have left Ukraine and who are right now kind of displaced and looking for, you know, for place to stay, for, you know, how to set up immigration, how, where to live, like where to eat, you know, where to send their kids to school, et cetera. So I know there's a lot of volunteers and we're trying to kind of organize some of this information space for people from Ukraine. So uh, check that portal out as well. Thank you, Ilya. It's been impressive that we managed to go this entire interview without talking about Nier, but these are the times that we live in. So I really appreciate you coming on the show and I hope you and your loved ones stay safe. Thank you.